Chapter Three of Cabbages and Kings by O. Henry. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Smith, Goodwin, and the ardent patriot Zavala took all the precautions that their foresight could contrive to prevent the escape of President Miraflores and his companion. They sent trusted messengers up the coast to Solitas and Alazan to warn the local leaders of the flight and to instruct them to patrol the water-line and arrest the fugitives at all hazards should they reveal themselves in that territory. After this was done there remained only to cover the district about Coralio and await the coming of the quarry. The nets were well spread. The roads were so few, the opportunities for embarkation so limited, and the two or three probable points of exit so well guarded, that it would be strange indeed if there should slip through the meshes so much of the country's dignity romance and collateral the president would without doubt move as secretly as possible and endeavour to board a vessel by stealth from some secluded point along the shore on the fourth day after the receipt of engelhardt's telegram the karlsefen a norwegian steamer chartered by the new orleans fruit trade anchored off coralio with three hoarse toots of her siren the karlsefen was not one of the line operated by the vesuvius fruit company she was something of a dilettante, doing odd jobs for a company that was scarcely important enough to figure as a rival to the Vesuvius. The movements of the Carlsefen were dependent upon the state of the market. Sometimes she would ply steadily between the Spanish Main and New Orleans in the regular transport of fruit. Next she would be making erratic trips to Mobile or Charleston, or even as far north as New York, according to the distribution of the fruit supply. Goodwin lounged upon the beach with the usual crowd of idlers that had gathered to view the steamer. Now that President Miraflores might be expected to reach the borders of his abjured country at any time, the orders were to keep a strict and unrelenting watch. Every vessel that approached the shores might now be considered a possible means of escape for the fugitives, and an eye was kept even on the sloops and dories that belonged to the sea-going contingent of Coralio. Goodwin and Zavala moved everywhere but without ostentation, watching the loopholes of escape. The customs officials crowded importantly into their boat and rowed out to the Karlsefen. A boat from the steamer landed her purser with his papers, and took out the quarantine doctor with his green umbrella and clinical thermometer. Next a swarm of carobs began to load upon lighters the thousands of bunches of bananas heaped upon the shore, and row them out to the steamer. The Karlsefen had no passenger list and was soon done with the attention of the authorities. The purser declared that the steamer would remain at anchor until morning, taking on her fruit during the night. The Carlsefen had come, he said, from New York, to which port her latest load of oranges and coconuts had been conveyed. Two or three of the freighter sloops were engaged to assist in the work, for the captain was anxious to make a quick return in order to reap the advantage offered by a certain dearth of fruits in the States. About four o'clock in the afternoon another of those marine monsters, not very familiar in those waters, hove in sight, following the fateful Idalia. A graceful steam-yacht, painted a light buff, clean-cut as a steel engraving. The beautiful vessel hovered offshore, seesawing the waves as lightly as a duck in a rain-barrel. A swift boat manned by a crew in uniform came ashore, and a stocky-built man leapt to the sands. The newcomer seemed to turn a disapproving eye upon the rather motley congregation of native Anchurians, and made his way at once toward Goodwin, who was the most conspicuously Anglo-Saxon figure present. Goodwin greeted him with courtesy. Conversation developed that the newly landed one was named Smith, and that he had come in a yacht. A meagre biography, truly, for the yacht was most apparent, and the Smith not beyond a reasonable guess before the revelation yet to the eye of Goodwin, who had seen several things, there was a discrepancy between Smith and his yacht. A bullet-headed man Smith was, with an oblique dead eye and the moustache of a cocktail mixer. And unless he had shifted costumes before putting off for shore, he had affronted the deck of his correct vessel, clad in a pearl-gray derby, a gay plaid suit, and Baudeville neckwear. Men owning pleasure yachts generally harmonize better with them, Smith looked business, but he was no advertiser. He commented upon the scenery, remarking upon its fidelity to the pictures in the geography, and then inquired for the United States Consul. 
Goodwin pointed out the starred and striped bunting hanging above the little consulate, which was concealed behind the orange trees. "'Mr. Getty, the consul will be sure to be there,' said Goodwin. "'He was very nearly drowned a few days ago while taking a swim in the sea, and the doctor has ordered him to remain indoors for some time.' Smith ploughed his way through the sand to the consulate, his haberdashery creating violent discord against the smooth tropical blues and greens. Getty was lounging in his hammock, somewhat pale of face and languid in pose. On that night when the Valhalla's boat had brought him ashore apparently drenched to death by the sea, Dr. Gregg and his other friends had toiled for hours to preserve the little spark of life that remained to him. The bottle, with its impotent message, was gone out to sea, and the problem that it had provoked was reduced to a simple sum in addition. One and one make two, by the rule of arithmetic one by the rule of romance. There is a quaint old theory that man may have two souls, a peripheral one which serves ordinarily, and a central one which is stirred only at certain times, but then with activity and vigor. While under the domination of the former, a man will shave, vote, pay taxes, give money to his family, buy subscription books, and comport himself on the average plan. But let the central soul suddenly become dominant, and he may, in the twinkling of an eye, turn upon the partner of his joys with furious execration. He may change his politics, while well, you could snap your fingers. He may deal out deadly insult to his dearest friend. He may get him, instanter, to a monastery or a dance-hall. He may elope, or hang himself, or he may write a song or poem, or kiss his wife unasked, or give his funds to the search of a microbe. Then the peripheral soul will return, and we have our safe, sane citizen again. It is but the revolt of the ego against order, and its effect is to shake up the atoms only that they may settle where they belong. Getty's revulsion had been a mild one, no more than a swim in a summer sea after so inglorious an object as a drifting bottle. And now he was himself again. Upon his desk, ready for the post, was a letter to his government, tendering his resignation as consul to be effective as soon as another could be appointed in his place. For Bernard Brannigan, who never did things in a halfway manner, was to take Getty at once for a partner in his very profitable and various enterprises, and Paula was happily engaged in plans for refurnishing and decorating the upper story of the Brannigan house. The consul rose from his hammock when he saw the conspicuous stranger in his door. "'Keep your seat, old man,' said the visitor, with an airy wave of his large hand. "'My name's Smith, and I've come in a yacht. "'You are the consul, is that right?' "'A big, cool guy on the beach directed me here. "'Thought I'd pay my respects to the flag.' "'Sit down,' said Getty. "'I've been admiring your craft ever since it came in sight. "'Looks like a fast sailor. "'What's her tonnage?' "'Search me,' said Smith. "'I don't know what she weighs in at, "'but she's got a tidy gait. "'The Rambler, that's her name, "'don't take the dust of anything afloat.' This is my first trip in her. I'm taking a squint along this coast just to get an idea of the countries where the rubber and red pepper and revolutions come from. I had no idea there was so much scenery down here. Why, Central Park ain't in it with this neck of the woods. I'm from New York. They get monkeys and coconuts and parrots down here. Is that right? We have them all, said Getty. I'm quite sure that our fauna and flora would take a prize over Central Park. "'Maybe they would,' admitted Smith cheerfully. "'I haven't seen them yet. "'But I guess you've got a skinned on the animal and vegetation question. "'You don't have much travel here, do you?' "'Travel?' queried the consul. "'I suppose you mean passengers on the steamers. "'No, very few people land in Coralio. "'An investor now and then. "'Tourists and sightseers generally go further down the coast "'to one of the larger towns where there is a harbor. "'I see a ship out there loading up with bananas,' said Smith. "'Any passengers come on her?' "'That's the Carlsefin,' said the consul. "'She's a tramp fruiter. Made her last trip to New York, I believe. "'No, she brought no passengers. I saw her boat come ashore, and there was no one. "'About the only exciting recreation we have here is watching steamers when they arrive, "'and a passenger on one of them generally causes the whole town to turn out. "'If you are going to remain in Corradio a while, Mr. Smith, I'll be glad to take you around to meet some people.' There are four or five American chaps that are good to know, besides the native high flyers. Thanks, said the yachtsman, but I wouldn't put you to the trouble. 
I'd like to meet the guys you speak of, but I won't be here long enough to do much knocking around. That cool gentleness Beach spoke of a doctor. Can you tell me where I could find him? The Rambler isn't quite as steady on her feet as a Broadway hotel, and a fellow gets a touch of seasickness now and then. Thought I'd strike the croaker for a handful of the little sugar pills in case I need him. You will be apt to find Dr. Gregg at the hotel, said the consul. You can see it from the door. It's that two-story building with the balcony, where the orange trees are. The Hotel de los Estrangeros was a dreary hostelry, in great disuse both by strangers and friends. It stood at a corner of the street of the Holy Sepulchre. A grove of small orange trees crowded against one side of it, enclosed by a low rock wall over which a tall man might easily step. The house was of plastered adobe, stained a hundred shades of color by the salt breeze and the sun. Upon its upper balcony opened a central door, and the two windows containing broad jalousies instead of sashes. The lower floor communicated by two doorways with the narrow, rock-paved sidewalk. The pulperia, or drinking shop, of the proprietress, Madama Timotea Ortiz, occupied the ground floor. On the bottles of brandy, anisada, scotch smoke, and inexpensive wines behind the little counter, the dust lay thick, save where the fingers of infrequent customers had left irregular prints. The upper story contained four or five guest rooms which were rarely put to their destined use. Sometimes a fruit grower, riding in from his plantation to confer with his agent, would pass a melancholy night in the dismal upper story. Sometimes a minor native official on some trifling government quest would have his pomp and majesty awed by Madama's sepulchral hospitality. But Madama sat behind her bar content, not desiring to quarrel with fate. If any one required meat, drink, or lodging at the Hotel de los Estrangeros, they had but to come and be served. Esta bueno. If they came not, why, then they came not. Esta bueno. As the exceptional yachtsman was making his way down the precarious sidewalk of the street of the Holy Sepulchre, the solitary permanent guest of that decaying hotel sat at its door, enjoying the breeze from the sea. Dr. Gregg, the quarantine physician, was a man of fifty or sixty, with a florid face and the longest beard between Topeka and Terra del Fuego. He held his position by virtue of an appointment by the Board of Health of a seaport city in one of the southern states. That city feared the ancient enemy of every southern seaport, the yellow fever, and it was the duty of Dr. Gregg to examine crew and passengers of every vessel leaving Coralio for preliminary symptoms. The duties were light, and the salary, for one who lived in Coralio, ample. Surplus time there was in plenty, and the good doctor added to his gains by a large private practice among the residents of the coast. The fact that he did not know ten words of Spanish was no obstacle. A pulse could be felt and a fee collected without one being a linguist. Add to the description the facts that the doctor had a story to tell concerning the operation of trepanning, which no listener had ever allowed him to conclude, and that he believed in brandy as a prophylactic and the special points of interest possessed by Dr. Gregg will have become exhausted. The doctor had dragged a chair to the sidewalk. He was coatless, and he leaned back against the wall and smoked while he stroked his beard. Surprise came into his pale blue eyes when he caught the sight of Smith in his unusual and prismatic clothes. "'You're Dr. Gregg, is that right?' said Smith, feeling the dog's head pin in his tie. "'The constable, I mean the consul, told me you hung out at this caravansary. My name's Smith, and I came in a yacht, taking a cruise around, looking at the monkeys and pineapple trees. Come inside and have a drink, Doc. This café looks on the blink, but I guess it can set out something wet. I will join you, sir, in just a taste of brandy, said Dr. Gregg, rising quickly. I find that as a prophylactic a little brandy is almost a necessity in this climate. As they turned to enter the pulperia, a native man, barefoot, glided noiselessly up and addressed the doctor in Spanish. He was yellowish-brown, like an overripe lemon. He wore a cotton shirt and ragged linen trousers girded by a leather belt. His face was like an animal's, live and wary, but without promise of much intelligence. This man jabbered with animation and so much seriousness that it seemed a pity that his words were to be wasted. Dr. Gregg felt his pulse. "'You sick?' he inquired. "'Mi mujer está enferma en la casa,' said the man, 
thus endeavouring to convey the news in the only language open to him that his wife lay ill in her palm-thatched hut the doctor drew a handful of capsules filled with a white powder from his trousers pocket he counted out ten of them into the native's hand and held up his forefinger impressively take one said the doctor every two hours he then held up two fingers shaking them emphatically before the native's face next he pulled out his watch and ran his finger round his dial twice again the two fingers confronted the patient's nose two 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 hours repeated the doctor si senor said the native sadly he pulled a cheap silver watch from his own pocket and laid it in the doctor's hand me bring said he struggling painfully with his scant english other watchy to-morrow then he departed downheartedly with his capsules a very ignorant race of people sir said the doctor as he slipped the watch into his pocket he seems to have mistaken my directions for taking the physic for the fee however it is all right he owes me an account anyway the chances are that he won't bring the other watch you can't depend on anything they promise you about that drink now how did you come to coralio mr smith i was not aware that any boats except the calcifin had arrived for some days the two leaned against the deserted bar and madama set out a bottle without waiting for the doctor's order there was no dust on it after they had drank twice smith said you say there were no passengers on the calcifin doc are you sure about that it seems to me i heard somebody down on the beach say that there was one or two aboard they were mistaken sir i myself went out and put all hands through a medical examination as usual the carlson finn sails as soon as she gets her bananas loaded which will be about daylight in the morning and she got everything ready this afternoon no sir there was no passenger list like that three star a french schooner landed two sloop-loads of it a month ago if any customs duties on it went to the distinguished republic of anchuria you may have my hat if you won't have another come out and let's sit in the cool a while it isn't often we exiles get a chance to talk with somebody from the outside world the doctor brought out another chair to the sidewalk for his new acquaintance the two seated themselves you are a man of the world said dr gregg a man of travel and experience your decision in a matter of ethics and no doubt on the points of equity ability and professional probity should be of value i would be glad if you will listen to the history of a case that i think stands unique in medical annals about nine years ago while i was engaged in the practice of medicine in my native city i was called to treat a case of contusion of the skull i made the diagnosis that a splinter of bone was pressing upon the brain and that the surgical operation known as trepanning was required however as the patient was a gentleman of wealth and position i called in for consultation doctor smith rose from his chair and laid a hand soft with apology upon the doctor's shirt-sleeve say doc he said solemnly i want to hear that story you've got me interested and i don't want to miss the rest of it i know it's a lula by the way it begins and i want to tell at the next meeting of the barney o'flynn association if you don't mind but i've got one or two matters to attend to first if i get em attended to in time i'll come right back and hear you spiel the rest before bedtime is that right by all means said the doctor get your business attended to and then return i shall wait up for you you see one of the most prominent physicians at the consultation diagnosed the trouble as a blood clot another said it was an abscess but i don't tell me now doc don't spoil the story wait till i come back i want to hear it as it runs off the reel is that right the mountains reached up their bulky shoulders to receive the level gallop of apollo's homing steeds the day died in the lagoons and in the shadowed banana groves and in the mangrove swamps where the great blue crabs were beginning to crawl to land for their nightly ramble and it died at last upon the highest peaks then the brief twilight ephemeral as the flight of a moth came and went the southern cross peeped with its topmost eye above a roll of palms and the fireflies heralded with their torches the approach of soft-footed night in the offing the carlsefin swayed at anchor her lights seeming to penetrate the water to countless fathoms with their shimmering lanceolite reflections the caribs were busy loading her by means of the great lighters 
heaped full from the piles of fruit ranged upon the shore. On the sandy beach, with his back against a coconut tree and the stubs of many cigars lying around him, Smith sat waiting, never re relaxing his sharp gaze in the direction of the steamer. The incongruous yachtsman had concentrated his interest upon the innocent fruiter. Twice had he been assured that no passengers had come to Coralio on board of her, and yet with a persistence not to be attributed to an idling voyager, he had appealed the case to the higher court of his own eyesight. Surprisingly, like some gay-coated lizard, he crouched at the foot of the coconut palm, and with the beady shifting eyes of the selfsame reptile, sustained his espionage on the Carlsefin. On the white sands a whiter gig belonging to the yacht was drawn up, guarded by one of the white-ducked crew. Not far away in a pulperia on shore following Gallier Grande, three other sailors swaggered with their cues around Coralio's solitary billiard-table. The boat lay there as if under orders to be ready for use at any moment. There was in the atmosphere a hint of expectation, of waiting for something to occur, which was foreign to the air of Coralio. Like some passing bird of brilliant plumage, Smith alights on this palmy shore, but to preen his wings for an instant, and then to fly away upon silent pinions. When morning dawned there was no Smith, no waiting gig, no yacht in the offing. Smith left no intimation of his missing there, no footprints to show where he had followed the trail of his mystery on the sands of Coralio that night. He came, he spake his strange jargon of the asphalt and the cafés, he sat under the coconut tree, and vanished. The next morning Coralio, smithless, ate his fried plantain and said, The man of pictured clothing went himself away. With the siesta the incident passed, yawning, into history. So for time must Smith pass behind the scenes of the play. He comes no more to Coralio nor to Dr. Gregg, who sits in vain wagging his redundant beard, waiting to enrich his derelict audience with his moving tale of trepanning and jealousy. But preposterously to the lucidity of those loose pages, Smith shall flutter among them again. In the nick of time he shall come to tell us why he strewed so many anxious cigar stumps around the coconut palm that night. This he must do, for when he sailed away before the dawn in his yacht Rambler, he carried with him the answer to a riddle so big and preposterous that few in Anchuria had ventured even to propound it. End of chapter 3 Recording by Eric Metzler Albuquerque, New Mexico, United States of America